I see you found our little hiding spot in the universe. Don't get too comfortable. This is a place where you will find those with an experience that's out of this world, and possibly deep within your life. I welcome you to the Oracles with James Tyson. Lean forward and listen. We will pull you into a supernatural journey with guests from around the world. Each one experiencing some of the most extraordinary phenomena this wee planet has to offer. Now, here are the Oracles with James Tyson. Thank you, Liam, and thank you, listener, for tuning into this episode of the Oracles with James Tyson. I am James Tyson. Today I bring you William Stick Evers. He's an astrologer who's been doing this since about 1988. Pretty much uh, full-time giving consultations, uh, astrological consultations to his clients. He's got a broad scope of political, economic, psychological, spiritual, and metaphysical knowledge. If you go to his website, bounce over to William Stick Evers. Dot com. Click on consultations. It gives you a really broad list of the modalities he draws from in his consultation. We are going to talk about horror ray astrology. We are going to talk a bit about medieval astrology. We're going to touch on that in the first hour. We are going to find out a little bit more about him and how he has developed his abilities over the last 30 plus years. He's out of Las Vegas, Nevada. You've probably heard him on shows uh, such as Coast to Coast. He will come in and do astrology forecasts. He talks about events coming up and right now he's very much out there wanting to talk to us about things such as financial meltdown that he sees uh, in the future here globally and uh, why he bases or why he sees it and what he bases that on it's interesting astrology is interesting because it's based on a constant it's, it's funny that it isn't brought out into the mainstream as pure science because it is based on something you can see happening and what i mean by that is we know when the constellations are going to be in certain points in the sky we also know when planets will be in the same orbit or they meet in certain locations sometimes they do this you know heck they do it daily sometimes uh they're in a specific spot every hundred years every 200 years every three eight hundred years thousand years and we are going to talk about what's coming up, and especially in the next hour, we are going to talk about a thing called the Jupiter-Saturn-Pluto alignment, which I believe is about an 800-year, uh, or 500 or 800-year uh, rotation that it comes up. And uh, one of the things that, that is fascinating with that, just one event uh, in history, if you were to go back each time this shows up or those are in alignment, uh, civilizations fall like full-on <laughs> like the roman empire things like that they crash uh the mongol empire so that's coming again 2020 we're having another one of those uh event well i should say we're not having an event maybe the jupiter saturn pluto alignment is coming we're going to talk about the paradigm shift in 2007 financial meltdown in the u.s in 2008 and how that is coming secular again we're also going to talk about in our last hour the x event now we're not going to be able to say this is what's going to happen the meteor is going to hit us uh the lights are going to go turned off it's going to be earthquakes fire global war nuclear we can't say any of that it's just that there is an x event coming because over time when the planets are in this alignment at this specific point something big happens and something big is coming we've talked about it a lot we'll also touch briefly on the u.s federal election and president trump's position in the disclosure of alien life and its activity around us William Stick Evers, great guy. He, uh, he basically, through his system, explores possibilities about the future and how they can emerge from the present and weaving through our current 
secular trends. And that is geopolitical. That is weather. That is everything. And it, oh, he looks at everything, even the mundane, from an astrological point of view. He is out of, uh, well, I told you he was out of Vegas, originally out of New York. Good Irishman. You can tell by his accent. Okay. I'm sure his family got to New York uh, about three or four generations ago because his accent's a little bit um, askew from the Irish. But very, very interesting gentleman. And I'm going to bring him out right now. William, how have you been? I've been doing great. Uh, since the Soul Summit, I've been very, very busy with clients and doing many radio shows. I was on Coast to Coast just recently. And, um, you know, it's just been so much going on. I've been posting quite a bit. I've been busy with my Patreon, which I started doing in early October. Just did my second show going on to my third next week. So it's been pretty busy, pretty exciting. A lot of stuff happening in the world, pretty much matching up with a lot of the forecasts I made earlier this year. Yeah, when we talked to the Soul Summit, you, um, I know we didn't have a lot of time together. You're rushing around, but uh, some of the stuff that you talked to me about w was fascinating. And these are the things that are, that you've been forecasting uh, that is coming up. And, and just like uh, when you were on um, on the panel, like were you, on a, you know, you were on a panel. You actually yeah. were doing a lecture, and you were yeah, on, I was, yeah. yeah, I was on the panel and lecture. Yes. Yeah, it um, it's fascinating. And we'll start off with tell my listener what it is you do and what your title is. Well, I am a astrological consultant, and what I do is I work with people who want to get um, informed about what's going on with their life what is likely to unfold over the coming time period. Um, many people who are in crisis, why they're in crisis, what strategies, what's uh, helping them to reframe and providing them strategies in terms of how to move forward. People come to me for financial advice. So people come to me for um, psychological or soul searching advice or People are going through transformational crises. People come to me when they need tactical advice on choosing between two universities for a master's program or PhD program. People come to me when they need to relocate. They just retired and there's several different options. And with astrology and astrocartography and astrolocality, we can, I can help them make a more informed decision going forward, depending on what their goals and where they're at in life. People call me about, um, relationship issues, relationship problems, if it's possible to salvage their marriage that's been in crisis for a few years, or it's too late or too little too late, or people who are in the process of who've been recently divorced, let's say, and looking to go back out there in the dating world and seeing, uh, helping them set their expectations, their non-negotiables, um, giving them timing, some strategy in terms of what's appropriate for them, not using 25-year-old criteria for the dating world they left 20 years ago. Uh, it, it, it varies. It really, you know, my consultations really vary depending on, you know, the business needs or um, sometimes my work requires some type of um, – determining when's the best time to start a business or to uh, commence a, an important project, so which is what we call electional astrology. So there's a whole series of different things. It really depends on what the needs of the client and where they're at in their life. Yeah, it's fascinating. I went through a number of your um... – basically what the, that's the scope of your work and the outline of uh, psychological astrology, archetyp, um, archetyp, how do you archetypal. say word? Archetypal. Archetypal and, yes. and, and Jungian astrology, medieval astrology, hor, horary, horary? Horary, horror, you got horary it. Horary astrology. These are, uh, well, obviously they're terms that I'm not familiar with because right. I can't get them to roll off my tongue. Right. Uh, and, and again, you've been doing this since 1988. So it, right been a while uh or actually in some cases you were when you were working with uh, vera waltz in philadelphia uh, right that was from 86 82 right uh, just with them so you've been in the the gig for forever um these like just arrows in your quiver that you, these are just things you can reach for when you have a specific challenge or you have a specific client come to you you can pull something out of each of these or do you kind of bring them all together as one modality when you're dealing with somebody well, you know, these are just 
um, it's a little bit of both. They were, I mean, I certainly didn't start off saying I'm going to become an archetypal astrologer and then I'm going to learn financial and geopolitical astrology and mundane astrology. It, it was sort of an evolution that was based on where I was at, based on my training, the particular teachers that I met along the way, the basis of the astrology I do today is more archetypally driven, which uh, is formally called archetypus, archetypal synchronistic resonance, which supports the Jungian, the Jungian process of individuation. So everything I do in my astrology is all about supporting individuation, uh, that inborn drive to become a, dis, uh, a more distinctive, complete, integrated person that reveals uh, in that process their special and individual nature or individual structure against the onrush of the conflicting values and beliefs that they encounter in the world. So uh, the hero's journey, if you will. And so all of these different methods of astrology, horror, election, all, etc., are all about different tools and applications to help that person individuate and stay along or stay on track with their individuation process. So you're basically, as you help others, it comes around and, and it, it lifts you. It's kind right. of a, um, it, it's part of your path. As you move forward and grow in who you are, it's fed by all those you help. That's correct. Where you can actually see that happening, where in other jobs you might, you know, you're a carpenter and yeah, I, I built you a chair, here it is. Oh, it makes you feel good. I'm going to go build another chair. Yes, I, we grow in our path, but yours seems to be exponential with the amount of positive, I almost said positive vibes, that positive energy <laughs> you put out. Right. You know what I mean, right? That, yeah, that, absolutely. That good, that good energy that goes out and right. every successful client comes through, it right. amplifies where you are in your life at this time. Right, right. And, you know, I sort of push the envelope that's just the type of guy I am, you know, if I'm in, I'm also that way when it comes to working out or uh, music and all the other things I have an interest in. I mean, I'm not happy with bench pressing the same weight that I was bench pressing five years ago. You know, I'm always pushing to get, you know, to get a, uh, a better, a better result and uh, increase the intensity, increase the depth, increase the quality, et cetera. So I apply that to my astrology. And I'm always trying to go deeper and broader with it. And um, because the demands, you know, life is getting very, uh, I mean, that's just, just, that's where we're going. We're in a massive paradigm shift and the same old, same old way of looking at the world or dealing with clients issues or people's issues that worked five years ago is not going to work today. In your clients too, uh, with, with that drive and with that work ethic when it comes to astrology do you ever find that uh, you'll create a chart for somebody and you think you're done on it and all of a sudden you rethink it and there's something else go crap now i've got to i'm going to tweak this or i'm going to get a hold of my client and say look this just occurred or this has just come up and i've got to update that well you know the software technology i mean i have an i background in IT in programming and infrastructure engineering. So fortunately, I had the software that will do all the heavy lifting where back in the 80s, when I first started, you had to really like do it all by hand. And it was a very arduous process. And of course, you would make many, you would, there would be a lot of oversight, simply because most astrologers simply could look at five or six, maybe seven testimonies simultaneously before they would derive and make a judgment or an insight that they would articulate to a client where the software today can project out 10 years using 720 criteria simultaneously and put it graphically on the screen and say that to a, just to a particular area of one's life, like this is one's love life. Okay, let's take a graph and look at their career arc. Let's look at this. Let's look at that. Let's look at your chart against 50 other people that you're considering hiring, right? You couldn't do that back in the day. So there's a lot less of that happening where you miss something along the way because of the technology. As, as you were explaining that to me, I picturing you doing a reading. What is it when you are setting a chart or getting ready or when you have to actually feed into a computer, get through the system? What are the base points that you look at? Let's say a career, somebody wants to talk about their career. What is it that, what's data is inputted? Well, they give me their birth date, birth time, and birthplace based on their record of birth. So I need an exact time. And if they don't, I provide them information depending on what state they were born in to get that birth record. 
so they can provide me that information. Because every four minutes makes a dramatic difference in, in terms of the personality structure and in terms of how the timing, the particular, the particular timing in terms of when certain developments will occur in an individual's life. So that's first and foremost. Secondly, I, I have different software for for particular applications. And what I'll do is draw up their chart. It'll create the position of the planets in relation to where they were born. And there's all these different techniques now where we can then uh, project out from there. You know, I'll do an overall black box. So a black box is taking like 720 or more criteria of transits, planetary transits in the sky, making direct aspects to their natal planets in their horoscope, and then projecting them graphically, positive, negative, sort of like their own personal Dow Jones Industrial. And I could go back from the time they were born to present or all, all the way out to the future and see when periods of crisis, change, transformation, breakthroughs, periods where they're flourishing are occurring. And then I can see where they're at right now relative to the past and relative to the future. It's pulling the data out of the people to move on to uh, right. attain the goal that uh, they're looking for. Now, you do a lot of your uh, consultation. Uh, is it, well, well, I would say it was going to be basic. There's the birth chart and business astrology, which is very, very common nowadays. A lot of people don't realize how many very large corporations use astrologists to help them quarterly. It's, right. um, it is very, very interesting on how many large companies do that. You also do something called a Hore Astrological Constellation. What is, uh, getting back to the words I, I'm not familiar with, what is Hore? Or Hore yeah, Hore Astrology is a specialized application of astrology that answers questions by using the time of birth of a question rather than the birth of a person. So it's really an ideal tool for consultations in that it is quick, concise, and straight to the point about a specific outcome. That is done through judging the strengths and positions of the aspects of the planets at the time of the horary question, at the time the horary question was asked. I can then judge the corresponding events, how the corresponding events here on Earth and predict an actual outcome. So someone will ask me, you know, the questions vary. Questions like, will I get a raise this year? Will I benefit financially from this partnership? Or can I afford to repay this loan? Should I take it out? Can I afford to pay it if it's, if it's granted to me? Uh, who will win the lawsuit? So these are questions that people can ask, and I will provide them an answer, whether it's yes and no, and then if it's no, why it's no. Because if it's yes, it's collect your money and go. But if it's no, we need to find out why it's no. And sometimes it's a conditional no, or it's a conditional yes, meaning, yeah, you could date this person, but you're going to regret it, right? Yeah. You, right. Or you could, you know, let's just put it to, like, like, especially with real estate, you could live here, but it's going to be fraught with problems later on that will not be revealed until months after you've closed the deal. So I've seen that where people just went ahead, they moved. I warned them not to. I said, you, you could buy this home. You'll be able to get the mortgage. But then they find out they need to put another $50,000 into it because they didn't do the adequate discovery with a, a house engineer, home engineer. You know, they didn't go through the right process. So you could see that right from the horror. So most of the time, it's very clear. Yes, you should be. You should not be. If so, when will I get a new job? And if so, when we could see that if the answer is yes, we could say yes. In six months time, you'll get the, you'll get a new job. That's very clear. And horror is interestingly enough, or more accurate than natal readings. So natal readings, I score about 80 within the mid 80% accuracy, but with the horror, it's about somewhere between 90 to a hundred. It's never a hundred, but it's, it's certainly in the low nineties. Yeah. In terms of accuracy, yeah. The horary readings, they really rely more on the different astrological houses right. than most of the other stuff. Other well, I would say it, the rules are much more rigorous. You, there's not, so what's interesting is you can have two astrologers or three astrologers look at a natal chart, and there would be consensus up to a certain point. And then there would be differences in inter interpretations and emphasis Mm -hmm. But with horror, everybody would be in 100% agreement about the testimonies. And, um, and they would all be in agreement if the answer was a yes or if the answer was a no. There would be no argument. So that's one thing I like about horror. There's no fluff. The rules are the rules. 
we're all in agreement about the rules and how are the weight of those rules. Is there anything, uh, any of the other astrological reading or consultation types that are close to that, or are you very, very precise on the information, the data going in, therefore better the data coming out, I guess, better, well, better product? accurate data is key to astrology. It's like, Without accurate data, we don't really have much to go on. I mean, a lot of astrologists, for instance, made a prediction at Hillary Clinton. I think it was like over 90% of the astrological community made a prediction Hillary Clinton would win in a landslide. And what was interesting about that was there was no birth time. There was no official birth time for Hillary Clinton. So they went ahead, made this prediction. It was very embarrassing for astrology. And it was very clear they ignored Trump's birth data, which we had a very precise time, and it was very clear that Trump was about to change his career. So many people felt, the astrologist said, well, there's no way Trump could win, so that must mean, even though this is the correct birth time, that Trump will lose the election and he'll just retire. He'll fade away. I mean, you could see here how if you don't have the birth time, you really can't make prediction and you can, it could be very, quite embarrassing. So the same thing applies when I do financial consultations. I have the birth time of every stock, bond, commodity, bank, every type of financial institution that is affecting your local economy right? Your personal economy and the national and global economy. You know, that data is necessary. We need the exact time in order to make, you know, very accurate financial and geopolitical predictions from. Yeah, it's fascinating that it's not just human beings that have a first time. It's items. It, Nations. Well, we perceived as inanimate I objects, but right. everything is animate. Everything is animate. Everything is alive. Everything has its own destiny. If it has a chart, if it has an inception moment, destiny is implied in that inception moment that is encapsulated within the horoscope. That's whether it's a person, whether it's a chicken, whether it's a nation, right? Whether it's a planet, right? We don't have the chart of the, of the earth. It would be nice. But like everything from a ship to, to a political concept, such as a constitution of a country, etc. I didn't know that. That's, that's yeah. actually really cool to um, break things down like that, which obviously expands your client base out a lot more. And then when people come in and, you know, they want to mm -hmm. drill down into, okay, the constitution was born on this date. Mm -hmm. At this it? time. Right. Yeah. And uh, so it, it, uh, how long, how long is it going to live? Right. Kind of right. And we can answer that question. We could actually say compared to, I don't have the graph in front of me, but I teach this in my geopolitical course, mundane astrology course, that we have the chart and the history and the timeline of every major civilization every major empire, when they started, when they ended, and when they peaked. So we could take that data from the past 5,000 years and then compare it to the American empire. And when it started at the time of when the constitution became effective, and we can project out from there, and we can project out when the U.S. US power will peak, et cetera. We're talking to William uh, Stickhavers. Go to his website, please, William stickevers.com and just follow along go to his uh, consultations go to the about section and go to those consultations and see exactly the type of work that he he's doing before we get on to what's coming up and what we can expect in the next little while in north america and globally uh one of the things that i noticed kind of jumped out at me on one of the, the types of work you do is that you apprenticed with a medieval astrology and alchemist fellow Robert Zoller. What is medieval astrology compared to what you do now? So medieval astrology is the type of astrology that developed after the collapse of the Roman Empire and what emerged through the medieval dark age just prior to the Renaissance when a horary electional astrology became a true medieval science around the period of the high middle ages in 12 1250 ad it's uh, i would say it predominates that period up to the elizabethan worldview of the time of the early renaissance so it sort of blends in with a lot of renaissance concepts but it's a um, a type of astrology that's very predictive it's an astrology that's very structured it, in a sense that fate is, you know, fate and destiny are intertwined with each other, that based on one's chart, one could, 
could map out the particular periods in life when fate and destiny would intervene beyond the power of one's free will. Oh, interesting. Right. And I'm pretty sure uh, during the uh, Spanish Inquisition, a lot of those people went into hiding. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, astrology endured through the Inquisition and endured through the scientific enlightenment, which attempted to destroy astrology. Uh, Astrology went through a near-death experience between 1700 and 1870, when astrology, Western astrology at least, went almost completely out of existence until the Theosophical Revival in New York and London happened in um, the late 1800s. Uh, I believe it started around 1870, 1873 in New York City, and that correlated with the uh, spiritualist the spiritualist right. movement, right? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, astrology made a big, big, big comeback, and it has been going ever since. And um, it's become more of a um, part of the cultural ethos now, especially with the proliferation of horoscopes and uh, horoscopes and magazines, horoscope books, and uh, pop astrology, which really – emerged right after the first world war just that alone that medieval kind of connection that that background and understanding of where various astrologies all started from in your quiver something to reach for and and one of your tools you have that and some things that most astrologers don't have you have the ability to remote view uh you're a medium right and right. you've done ufo research so right. you've right. gone that extra step out where okay, if this is real, <laughs> right. I wonder if, and you've actually gone out there and go, oh, yeah, that's real too. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That is something that uh, most astrologers kind of either split it down the middle as I, I will not, like, this is all I do, or that's kind of what I do. But you have uh, quite the toolkit to uh, right. draw. Well, you know, a lot of it has to do with the fact that um, astrology since 1945 has been operating in a postmodern worldview. And that postmodern worldview is a worldview where we live in a dead, random, mechanistic, postmodern universe where, you know, if it can't be measured or validated by science, it is not real, it's invalid. Academic institutions and science determine what is so and what is not so. So uh, if the government says UFOs don't exist, right, that's the way it is. Obviously, that changed this year. Right. When the Navy came out and said UFOs are real and get used to it. So, right. That was the game changer. But see, one of the things about archetypal astrology, which is something that emerged out of the transpersonal psychology movement that began in 1968 and began to develop in Esalen, California, was a what we would call a uh, an archetypal cosmology. And archetypal cosmology is one that directly implies that all objective bodies in the universe, from planets to subatomic particles, possess an interior subjective reality. Nature has within and without and consists of external bodies with internal experiences analogous to feelings, ideas, and and intentions. So it's basically looking at um, or suggesting the universe has an inner and outer dimension and it mirror images of one reality that is both psychic or psyche and cosmos. And um, when, you, when you, you know, that type of breakthrough correlates with a lot of what we see uh, in the developments of quantum physics and string theory. Uh, and it basically uh, uh, helps establish that synchronicity, right? We know that synchronicity occurs, right? This is an established principle that was discovered, or at least if it wasn't discovered by Young, I think it was articulated by Young. I think he is the prime um, person who, who stated that synchronicity is as key to the understanding and uh, between the external and external reality, right? And when um, many astrologers are operating within the modern dichotomy, di- the modern dichotomy that um, you know, they're trying to do astrology in a universe that's dead and meaningless and that somehow there's some physical model that is somehow making, that makes 
planets that are transiting in the sky have some type of gravitational or some type of, you know, undiscovered mechanism towards relating to how people's behavior changes or why people go through crises or how the uh, psychology of one's personality develops, that there's some physical model behind it. Uh, because that, again, is this postmodern world view that everything has to be scientific based on a mechanistic, materialistic, physical model of the universe, where the type of astrology or the type of world view that came out of the transpersonal or archetypal cosmology, which is which archetypal astrology is a practice of, is living in a universe that's purposeful and evolving and sentient and a self-aware cosmos that we all participate, that we co-participate in, in the unfolding of our own evolution and the cosmos evolution. That's the difference. Uh, this isn't going to be on the test, is it? <laughs> no, no. This is a, I get a lot of resistance from many astrologers who, who think what I'm just saying now is heresy, although the research has proven this out to be so. And the deeper we go into physics and science, we're seeing this to be so. It's really interesting. The astrologer is really open to believing that transits have an impact, planetary transits have an impact on an individual's life, but they're very skeptical about synchronicity, right? Which you think is a little bit odd, too, because... If you're dealing with the transit of planets, it's all right. synchronized. Correct. Yes. But here's the problem. The moment you say you recognize the multi multidimensionality, a multivalent interdimensional variability, the planetary cycles are essentially archetypal patterns in human experience that have that are multifac multifaceted, multidimensional, uh, multivariant, uh, co-participatory, right? in the, evol the evolving fate of an individual or a civilization, that completely destroys or goes against the scientific type of model that enables insurance companies to consider granting, uh, uh, that gives the green light to giving astrologers to get compensated, to get, you know, like essentially what doing social workers do. So yeah. many astrologers, look, there was a big drive for at the seven in the seventies and the eighties to do a lot of astrological research to prove out to the social sciences that this is a science it works within a scientific model there is some science there is some particular model physical model behind this based on this postmodern worldview that can justify why a sh people should be getting compensated through their insurance to go to an astrologer but what I'm proposing to you what we've been discussing completely completely is heresy and, and, mm -hmm. and antagonistic to that type of worldview that we see so predominant today. Well, the other thing, too, is you, you, bunch, you, you then would bump into people's specific religious views, too. If you get mm -hmm. uh, seven-day advent nuts, uh, what was I thinking? The um, Fundamentalist. Jehovah Witnesses. The Jehovah Witnesses, they're like, right. like I don't want to talk about this. It's all woo-woo which I, I, I grasp the term woo-woo. I, I, right. I, I respect that is who I am. I'm a woo-woo person. But you get some real heavy-duty Christians that, nope, you can't. Astrology is irrelevant, and it's, it's part right. of the devil and all this. Right. So you've got to get through them. Yeah. They're working at my insurance company. I'm going to go get, you know, hey, I want you to pay for my chart so I know what's <laughs> going on. Or before I get right. my bank loan or my mortgage or my uh, – I, I want to get a loan for starting a business up, and my loans officer – and I say, look, you know, I've actually got an astrology chart. Look at this chart. And he goes, well, the devil will get away from me because I'm right. Just, right. Right. You know, you're running into that kind of culture shock. Right. Too. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, astrology is very disruptive to many of the prevalent religious and materialistic scientific worldview models that many of our institutions and religions and are based on. That's the problem. It's almost like a thorn in the side. But the good news is that a lot of the research in cosmology that's using experimental models that's being done all over the world is now proving out that we live in essentially in a, uh, a an archetypal uh, cosmology, that the universe is sentient, alive, growing, self-aware, forming and informing, shaping and determining um, and animating nature 
and our, and individuals within and without at every level, seen and unseen, known and unknown, tangible and intangible. That's fascinating. Again, we're talking to William Stickevers. He is an astrologist. Please go to his website, williamstickevers.com. Check out what he does. Go to his About Bio. Book a consultation if you're interested. This is fascinating stuff. Yeah, again, let's go back to what's coming up. What is the future? You were very excited at the Soul Summit in Scottsdale and wanted to kind of pass on things that you had seen that are coming up for us, North America and globally. Can you shed some light on or give us a heads up on? What's coming up is we're going to reach this uh, peak period where we're going to see a tremendous... Well, we've already started. Let me go back here. So starting 2007, we began to transition into this new period, this new paradigm. A paradigm shift uh, was emerging that correlated with the uh, Uranus-Pluto alignment. And around that time in 2007 was the beginning of the global financial crisis. It just started and it went full-blown the following year in 2008, and it resulted in the Lehman shock and the, the, the Lehman financial meltdown, which almost basically uh, destroyed the, uh, the banking system as we understand it today. And, um, and then we saw all of the geopolitical turmoil as a result of that take place, right? So that has been unfolding and intensifying and accelerating. We've seen like, a, like just list, let's list out some of the things that just occurred since this alignment went into effect in 2007 and will culminate and culminate and converge with another major alignment, which is the Jupiter, Saturn, Pluto triple alignment. So you have Uranus, Pluto square alignment, and then you have it peaking and converging in 2020 to 2021 with this triple alignment of Jupiter, Saturn, Pluto. And the last time we had that alignment, that combination was the collapse of the medieval age. It was the collapse of the Islamic Caliphate, the Mongol Empire, the Chinese Empire. We saw a number of major wars break down, break out. We saw um, the end of the medieval warm age and the emergence of the little ice age that occurred and remained the dominant weather for a good hundred years on the planet. We saw uh, at that time, um, we also saw the break, the breakup of the Catholic church. We saw the emergence of the Renaissance and the scientific era. Uh, we saw uh, it just, there was a number of things occurring uh, at the at, at so many levels simultaneously and by the way that's about the time of the black death so the black death in uh, around the late uh 1280s when this alignment occurred exactly it's like actually exactly 1284-85 was when it uh moved through asia killed 60 percent of the asian population and killed 50% of the European population all within, a, all within a span of five years. So that's more than any war has ever produced, you know, up to this point. So all of those things happen, and now we're moving into that same alignment now, but with even greater intensity than that period. Well, it's got more people that has to kill. I mean, uh, it's got, we've got a cull. It's, it's maybe we have a culling coming, and uh, right. it's coming with a greater intensity because there's more of us. Uh, well, it's not just that; it's coming with greater intensity because there's more at stake. We we we've created an unsustainable civilization at this point. You know, a fossil fuel driven, zero sum financial in the world where. Uh, there is not enough resources for everyone on the planet to live like the hundred thousand dollar income American citizen. Yeah. That rift between the haves and the have nots is widening, just flying apart. Like it's, right. they're going two different directions at light speed. Right. So you know, it's a lot of that is coming to a head. So what's happening here is that you're seeing a rift between the have and the have-nots. You're seeing massive economic and wealth inequality, political inequality, emergence of populism, 
happening rampant all throughout the planet. We're also seeing a split between the postmodern worldview and this new emerging worldview or Kairos. This During paradigm shifts, there is an emergence or the changing of the gods, if you will, where the, the way we look at the world and what dominates our thinking is, is changing. And this is all accelerating and intensifying. It's all coming to a head, and it just seems to correlate with um, the upcoming general election next year. And that's, that is of interest because people, my listener in Australia will say, well, how is that going to affect me? Or somebody in, in, in Ireland, Southern Ireland is going to say, well, you know, it's the U.S. general election. How is that going well, to affect me? Th- well, just remember, whatever happens in the U.S. politically, financially, geopolitically is going to impact every nation. It in, in a significant way. If, if the U.S. is doing well, everybody else does better. You know, if the U.S. catches a cold, everyone else goes to pneumonia. If the U.S. is in critical care, it could literally mean the end of their governments as they know it. That people don't realize the impact the U.S. has unless they're very savvy about financial markets and the uh, interbank dependencies. But I think the bigger thing is, is that even if they don't want to believe that, even though what I'm stating is true, but let's say they don't want to believe that this Jupiter, Saturn, Pluto alignment is going to his, you know, this, this alignment is going to have direct impact on them individually and on their respective countries. And it's when this, when the dust settles, this period will be considered one of the greatest importance of shaping world history. We had talked about a shift coming in 2014 on a, podcast I was doing back then Mm -hmm. and predicted leaders around the world would be brought into positions of leadership that would bring their countries to the Mm -hmm. edge. And and the U.S. was going to have a leader that would bring the country to the tip of a razor blade that could fall either way. Right. uh, There's nothing anyone could do about it. It was this person has to be at that place in this time in history for what's coming. You say what you want about your president, but, you know, he's bringing he's got he's got people off the couch who've been sitting on their ass since 1960. Right. Are now paying attention to what's going on. Right. Uh, right. And, and not only internally, but globally and environmentally, but your rivers in Alaska that have been left alone and, and, and put under government protection are now being talked about, you know, open pit mining, which will wipe out the salmon, which then will affect right. the orca. Well, it, basically the right. environmental devastation, right. but right. no one had been talking about that before. Right. So we have an ecological crisis, environmental crisis. I see us moving to global cooling. I think the whole global warming thing is a scam. That's all about Agenda 21. All right. Um, well, hold on. What's Agenda 21? Agenda 21 is a UN agenda for access control. It's basically having sovereign control of nations through land rights, through implementing global policies that supersede national policies. It was something that Barack Obama was really behind very strongly. And since then, Trump has, um, you know, basically obstructed the uh, tw- Agenda 21 um, initiative. You know, so, I mean, when you look at the Jupiter-Saturn-Pluto conjunction, Trump very much, and the Uranus-Pluto conjunction, the Uranus-Pluto square combined with the Jupiter-Saturn-Pluto conjunction, you could see it's more likely Trump will continue to dominate as setting a narrative as we make this paradigm shift transition. Uh, I don't think an Elizabeth Warren, that type of uh, approach, she doesn't seem to resonate with that type of symbolism, at least. Mm-hmm. Part of the, what the symbolism means is the philosophical justification for ruthless pursuits and hard and ruthless ambition where the ends justify the means. That doesn't sound like Elizabeth Warren. That sounds more like Donald Trump. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So if we're moving into that survival of the fittest modus operandi, where dominating the collective mindset, you know, desiring to elevate oneself at the expense of others using unsavory and ruthless means, we're not looking at like socialist leadership that is looking to find consensus among the population. We're seeing a much more extreme type of leadership, but that type of leadership is a result of the type of crisis that we're, that's already begun. So where these type of leaders will have to do extreme things in order to assist some type of radical reconfiguration event. It's interesting. I had a lady, uh, Marianne Morgan, who was uh, Nancy Reagan's psychic and a few other people, uh, still international politicians come to her 
and things like that. She's mm-hmm. a very, very interesting lady. And she said, oh, yeah, by the way, Trump's going to win the next election. And he may not make it through the third year, but she says it's something medical. It's nothing Right, right. Yeah, so. yeah, and that might be true. I haven't looked at his um, second term. I just looked up to the end of this term. And I was very clear, even at the Seoul Summit, when people were asking me, is Trump finished? Is 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 he going to drop out? Is he going to be impeached? There's nothing astrologically indicating that. In fact, I think Trump is going to get stronger as we get into 2020. And that will correlate with the crisis. He has a chart for being a president or leading a particular industry when it's in a period of crisis and transition. You saw that with real estate. You saw that with the television, right? To be right. You saw that with TV when there was a paradigm shift in TV from um, the type of TV we grew up with in the eighties to the reality TV show where he dominated for 10 years. Uh, we saw that in the industry where he was in prior with the real estate, although he's still in real estate, but, you know, he was in that particular period. So he represents his chart. He brings with him a certain type of uh, energy that uh, ex- intensifies and accelerates whatever crisis one is in, right? Whatever that industry or whatever that nation or entity is in, it's going to come out full force. Yeah, it, it's fascinating to look back in in uh, what we said about whoever this leader was going to be back in 2014. And after the 2017 election, I'm talking to my friends a couple of days after the election, they're walking around dumbfounded, like, how the hell did he win? Right. And they'd say it out loud at their office. And one of the, their buddies who had been friends for 20 years said, well, I voted for him. Why didn't you? And they <laughs> right. both look at each other like they're both from different planets. Because they don't understand that each person has their own path to and and yes, that person you, you're you're symbiotic, symbiotic with this person all of your life. But in that one incident, the guy voted for Trump and says, "How could you not vote for Trump?" And the other people are looking at him like, "What are you from Mars?" And the guy who votes for Trump is going, "No, you're nuts." And it's it it is so ingrained. But they had to. Those people had to. That was the path that they're on. They had to vote for him to get him where he is because he had to be where he is as a result of where our planet is going. Right. right. And and mm-hmm. for me, and, and I do it every day, I look at every, you know, I flip on the news and we're in Canada. We look at him and go, what a buffoon. He's lying. Aren't you? Can't, look, his, he's lying. And people are standing there going, no, he's not lying. You're right. lying. And it's like, right. okay, I don't understand how you can think that, but. I kind of laugh at my own self because, uh, okay, I do understand why you can think that because you have to. It is that time in our history where these people have to be supporting that person because that person is needed to be in a position. Right. I agree with that. And so, you know, this gets down to, so what's happening here is we have these two major alignments, the Uranus-Pluto, just to give you an idea, I didn't really explain the Uranus-Pluto as as well as I could have. The last time we had a Uranus-Pluto alignment that started in 2007 and will peak in 2022 was the 1960s, from 62 to 73. That's a time of the... Vietnam uh, War. We had the Vietnam War, but more importantly, we had the countercultural revolution, sexual emancipation revolution. We had the space race. We had the microprocessor revolution. We had the revolution in uh, music uh, with Beatlemania and uh, all of the, you know, the emergence of rock and roll or rock music. Mm-hmm. We saw the artistic revolution. We saw the sexual revolution. We saw uh, women's rights, gay rights revolution. Uh, we saw the ecology revolution, the, the ecologic, you know, ecological awareness, Earth Day, all those type of Woodstock, all these type of events, the human being movement, all coming out of the U.S. at that, and and to a lesser extent to England, although England was in, integral, but really the ground zero was happening in New York, California, for these type of events that shaped the history of the planet, and also it was. Um, A time where uh, there was disclosure or major events were happening with UFOs and um, where science fiction, like with Star Trek, became like went from being a fringe subject to mainstream due to right 
the rise of color television, etc. So he had all these massive innovations occurring. So uh, we saw revolutions in the 60s, like most of the colonies in Africa and Asia became independent. So this tremendous populism, there was massive protests in America, in Europe, France, there was uh, the Chinese um, Cultural Revolution with Mao. All of these were happening at the same time during this Uranus Pluto alignment. And now we see it playing itself out again, like we saw back with um, the massive protests, the uh, Arab Spring, where 27 nations went into revolution simultaneously in 2011. A lot of people forgot about that. We also saw the emergence of massive populist movements that came as a result of the collapse of the Lehman crisis, Occupy Wall Street, which was not just centered in New York, but throughout throughout most of the Western world. We saw that protest really take off for a while. So we just saw, you know, we saw the beginning of Donald Trump's rise to power. And not only that, we saw the emergence of the British exit right? The British exit. Uh, we saw the um, massive populist movements occurring in Greece, in Italy, in France, uh, all trying to break out of the euro now. You know, so there's emergence of, of this geopolitical changes where we see the alliance of Russia and China again against the U.S. Uh, we see, um, you know, and we've just seen uh, while the while Wall Street continues to make uh, tremendous gains and made a full recovery, Wall Street is or Main Street, Main Street, or the middle class person has continues to deleverage ten years in a row now. So people are worse off worldwide who are once middle class who pretend they're middle class, right? While Wall Street and we have an oligarchical elite, right? We have a two a bifurcated society, both in Europe, Canada. America, even China, even Asia, as a result of what happened as a result of this Uranus-Pluto alignment that impacted the world markets. And all of this is coming to a head when you have this Jupiter-Saturn-Pluto alignment, which happens, you know, um, uh, well over every 500 some odd years. What, um, well, oh yeah. When you were talking about the the sixties, early seventies, uh, what else was? Uh, I took. I remember taking a political terrorism course in university because uh, if you want to be a terrorist in Canada, you needed the course. But, um, <laughs> but what we found was um, what was wasn't really for, referred to as domestic terrorism back then, but the terrorist groups that occurred around the world through the U.S. Uh, from. Um, Patty Hearst's group out in California right. to groups in Chicago and Florida, um, you know, doing bank robberies and shootings and all sorts of man bombings. And, um, and over in Europe, um, uh, whether the weathermen and things like that, that was all, those people grew up and kind of hit their stride in coming out of high school and going into college in, in the late sixties. And, radicalized and then all of a sudden hit the streets in the early seventies and started right. blowing stuff up. Right. Yeah. So we had a, a, a real, th those, that time when people look back and say, Oh, this is all peace, love kind of, that was the time of peace, love and, and flower and power music and flower power. And it was, and it was, it there was, was a certain, yeah, it was, it but was there, both, but there was a black, a really a dark, shadow shadow there yes. that when you point back at it you say well exactly at the same time people were at hate nashbury passing out flowers they were blowing up stuff in chicago oh they were blowing yeah. up stuff even in, in in san francisco in san francisco yeah so right. but we we always want to gravitate back to the the fluffy right. stuff as opposed well, you know to forget the negative yeah, of course well you know there was a shadow period to the 60s too yeah. Right. And that's the uh, radicalization of youth defiance that was happening on a mass scale. Now, th th these weren't these were kids who grew up in middle to upper middle class educated families. Right. right? This is right. Nobody saw that coming. So we're now seeing it emerge again powerfully with the millennials and the Gen Zers who are now coming to age where they're becoming very radicalized. Uh, 
because they can no longer participate in the type of economy that no longer rewards them for their level of education or efforts, right? Um, they're not even, they no longer buy cars. They, they don't buy cars. They don't buy homes. Uh, they, 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 they need layaway for $200 items now. I mean, so you're seeing a radicalization, uh, you know, just like there was tune in, turn on, drop out, right? Fueled by LSD, you're going to see something new emerge uh, probably next year where you see massive youth defiance. So when I say youth, I'm talking 45 to 25. I'm not talking 18 year olds, mm -hmm. right? Or early 20 year olds up to 45 revolting at a massive organized way probably at first through the internet if it's not already happening now, yeah. but, but in a bigger way. Yeah. It's not just going to be, it's going to be happening on the internet. That's where the action is going to be. Yeah. Where, where you look back in the sixties, it happened on campus. Right. With flyers. Right. And, or in music. Right. Uh, we don't have that type of social music anymore. Like we no. did back then. No, the because it's all corporate made. controlled. It's all corporate controlled music. So the music of the two, the 2020s is going to come through the internet. That's going to uh, galvanize and radicalize and inspire the coming revolt. Amazing. We're talking to uh, William Stickevers. Go to his website, williamstickevers.com. Check out what he does, his astrological work. See if that was is something you'd be interested in and contact him through his website. Again, williamstickevers.com. William, what else do you see coming? Out well, there you know, calling at us? I did a, um, okay, so I did a presentation in September because I, I wanted to do this presentation like in early January, February of next year, but I, for a number of uh, serendipitous events, plus my remote viewing sessions indicated to me that I couldn't wait any longer. I needed to come out and say it. So I did a two-part presentation on uh, the coming global transformational crisis. And that has to do primarily with the emergence of China as not just an economic competitor, but an emerging economic war and a uh, cold war that would emerge called a Thucydides trap. So uh, that was number one. That was the first part. What, sorry, what trap was it? Yeah, the, 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 the Thucydides trap. Let me, T-H-U-C-Y-D-I-D-E-S, Thucydides trap. And there's been 16 Thucydides trap scenarios since uh, the Peloponnesian War. Out of the 16 times where the dominant world power was being challenged by an emerging world power, that dominant world power proactively uh, went to war before that challenging world power could overtake it. So that happened 12 out of 16 times. So we are in a Thucydides trap window where you see the rise of the Red Dragon where can America and China escape the Thucydides trap? And it looks like right now the answer is no, because in every Thucydides trap scenario, the country, when they went from a currency war to a trade war, within a short amount of time, that trade war turned into a cold war and, became, and resulted in a hot war. That's what I see. Now, what's interesting is that every time I have – we have seen these Thucydides wars or these Thucydides conflicts emerge. Major astrological alignments were occurring in the sky. I mean, these were not something that would happen every few years, but events or alignments that would occur every several hundred years. And now we have this massive triple planetary alignment that's occurring right now as we have a trade war that has escalated into a cold war, that has escalated into a full economic conflict that is likely to go at this point into a shooting war of some type. I mean, the potential is there. We cannot mm -hmm. play it down and ignore it and extend and pretend. On top of that, I also saw that a coming global crash and financial reset, right, where just prior to these Thucydides wars, every time there was a Thucydides war, the world at that time was on the verge of a financial reset and where they reassessed, you know, the financial system collapse, markets collapsed, and they had to determine, you know, they had to determine the new, like, repay currencies. You know, it was a real messy affair. But the last time we had a 
global financial reset was in 1933 when they closed the, all the banks worldwide for several weeks. In the United States, it was up to 10 days. They closed all the banks. They reset. They wrote off all the debt. They repegged the price of gold and they confiscated money out of your checking and savings accounts, and then they reopened the banks. That was in 1933 in March. That also happened in Europe. That happened in Asia. So that was a global financial reset. And then what did we have a few years later, seven years later? No, actually less. Six years later, we had what? The first Second World War Second emerged. World War. Second World War. So these are the last Thucydides War we fought was World War II. The one prior to that, World War I. The one prior to that, the Napoleonic War and the War of 1812 with England. So I can go back every time we see it as an economic crisis, we see an emerging world power, we see a dominant world power, and we see the dominant world power say, I'm not waiting around for this guy to, to, to take me out. I'm going to hit him now while I'm still in a position where I still have the advantage. The advantage. And, and for people who don't think China can do anything, um, they've got a, a truck-mounted missile that is specifically designed to take out an aircraft carrier. Right. It's, um, it's yeah. guided just like up into the atmosphere, down on top of the aircraft carrier. Right. And on. Well, I, will, I, I do address the fact that um, the U.S. has defenses for that weapon. I mean, one of the big oh, they have to because yep, you know it's, it's public. That thing went public, so right. you kind of have to look at it and go, yeah. Right. Right. Uh, well, every aircraft carrier. Just so I just want to get. I know this is where they deviating That's, from the point, okay. but I just want to make this. A lot of these states that come out that China has this and the U.S. is defenseless. The U.S. is six generations naval and air warfare, six generations ahead. So if they want to start a fight they are really risking their entire, it's going to be an existential crisis for China if they decide to, you know, go forward in a conflict. Uh, the U.S. aircraft carriers have task groups that are assigned to them, and they have tremendous amount of weapons, platforms, uh, known defense systems, but they have more classified defense systems. So, you know, I just want to point that out, that China is an emerging threat. Yes, theoretically, they could sink our carriers. Theoretically, they could, um, uh, they could strike the continental mainland. Theoretically, they could dominate the Pacific if they play that card. Uh, the question is, is the U.S. going to stand by and let that happen? And I just don't see Trump standing by and letting that happen. I just don't see that like, mm -hmm. with the type of talk he has. So I talked about this, and I have a webinar for those who are interested. It's a two-part webinar. Uh, oh, the first one is three hours. The second one's four hours. The first one is the rise of the Red Dragon. Can America and China escape the Thucydides trap? And part two is the coming global crash and financial reset. And could it happen again? And I state why it's likely to happen again. And just a couple of weeks after I finished doing them, the repo markets, the interbanking lending, overnight lending, in order for banks to maintain liquidity, they lend money to each other. Okay. I won't go into the minutiae of it, but, but when banks are not willing to lend to each other, then it leads to a liquidity crisis. And the last time we saw that type of repo market intervention by the Federal Reserve was, was about a month before the Lehman crisis broke out in September 2008. So it was like in late August, early September, we saw the repo markets uh, have liquidity problems. The Fed intervened. They said, everything is fine. Nothing to see here. Move on. And then boom. A big bank went under. We have been in a repo market liquidity crisis since September 17th. That's a few weeks after I finished. Actually, I did the I did the coming global crash and financial reset on September 8th. So I said there would be an event that that the Fed would claim it's fine, steady as it goes, nothing to see here, move on. Sometime between now and Christmas. And that will be the moment, that will be your moment to put yourself in safe positions. That will be your moment to put, to make sure you're ready for a crisis. And we are running out of time because many people aren't taking it seriously. 
I can bring down an entire company by buying stock in it. So I, I, I hate to, uh, hate for you to say, Hey, you should buy this one, James. And then I buy it and wipe out the company. I've got a history of uh, <laughs> buying high and, and watching it disappear. And I just bought a new motorcycle and financed it. So that's good. So maybe the bank will go away and I'll get the motorcycle for free. Right. Uh, because right. everyone will be too busy to repossess it. It'll be- well, you know, I see a lot of this debt defaults coming and liquidation. Here's the thing. You got to remember markets before the Lehman crisis in 2008 the recession started with massive Fed intervention in December 2007. And then everything seemed, the parties continued to carry on. I, and it was a lot of extend and pretending going on with the markets. Well, the smart money was selling massive amounts of stock and bonds. They were putting themselves in very safe positions. And we're seeing that happen now. In fact, there's a smart money index. The smart money index is moving faster into gold, into very safe, safe assets, hard assets, more so than they were in September 2008. A friend of mine, actually, and uh, the psychic I was talking about, Marianne Morgan, her son, uh, friends of mine are buying silver. Like out of the blue, like, you'd be talking to somebody and they'd say, yeah, by the way, are you buying silver? Because I'm buying a lot of it. It's going to be up to hundreds of dollars an ounce. And I'm looking at it, I'm going, you know, I heard that once before when those Texans bought it. Right. Up to about $90 an ounce before it crashed. But are you talking about like getting yourself in a position? Because I'd always be afraid to buy paper. No, no. If you don't stock. own it, you don't hold it, right? If you don't hold it, you don't own it, right? It's right. Vice versa. So here's the thing. The problem is, is that people still believe in the fiat currency model. But the, but the issue is, is that they're not reporting what's really happening. If, if people understood the repo markets like I do, and I'm, I'm, I'm a quick learner, but I had to, I've spent a, a lot of time on this because I, when I saw the problem emerge, it's a very complex market to understand. But without going into it, I, I'm realizing if you have substantial assets in banks or, you, or you're doing your business through banking like most of us are, and you had any idea about what's really happening at the deepest level of the market itself, of, the, of that particular niche market that's integral for banks in order to operate for their, for, their, for, their mark, for their actual operations, you would be pulling all your money out right now. You would waste. You would wait. You would not trust the Fed. Uh, just for my listener, what is a, a repo market? Is it re, it's short for repurchase market or for repurchase agreements, transactions for collateral on short term loans and things like that, correct? Right, correct. Yeah. So basically, what a lot of people think their money's safe, they, people say, well, William, I don't have to worry. My, my money's not in a checking account, safe account, a bank account. It's in a market, a money market account. Where do you think the banks are accessing? They're accessing your money in your money market instrument or account and they're using that money to swap to swap and lend and buy with other banks in order to remain liquid so it's the money market that allows them to remain liquid or to be used as collateral for, with short-term lenders you know i i, I kind of have to defer to people like you who study this thing study stuff like this because it's above my pay grade when it's uh, beyond my I was going to say checkbook, but I don't have one of those anymore. Um, <laughs> Good for you. When I look at it on my, when I open my bank app on my phone and go, oh, I hope the internet never goes down because I will never, I, I won't have access to money anymore. So we, we've scared my listener about a possible threat of war, a, uh, and now we've got a possible threat of a, a financial, uh, global mm-hmm. financial um, upheaval, right, and reset. Right. So what else can we screw them up with? What There's else more, but wait, but wait, there's more, right. and there is more. So all, all of these are symptoms of something even bigger happening, and that's called an X event. And X events are unexpected major events that change the course of history for the upcoming or for that particular century, for that 100 years. And they're potent long-term global events they have global long-term significance and they often occur they actually since going back to the 400s at the time of the sack of the sack of rome during the western roman empire they occur during the second decade of each century so if you have a new century just go to the second decade and you can be sure going back from the 20th century 
to 400 AD, there was a major X event that changed the course of history for that 100 years. If we go back just 100 years, you have World War I, August 4th, 1914. My birthday. That's right. Except a different year. but Different year. Yeah. And if you, go, <laughs> if you go back another 100 years, June 24th, 1812, French invasion of Russia, Napoleonic Wars, and U.S. and Britain go at it again for the second time. Uh, America invades Canada, or attempts to. Uh, I mean, it was a big war, right? Then you go back another 100 years, and you have a massive Jacobite rebellion in England where the British crown was almost overthrown. Yeah. The Brits don't talk about that too much. But at the height of the empire was a massive, rev an attempted revolution. There was other things going on as well. Go back another 100 years, right? And you have the, you have the 100 years war break out in 1415. Go back another 100 years, you have Scotland's de facto independence. Go back another 100 years to 1215, you have the Magna Carta. Go back another 100 years, the Knights Templar are founded. Go back another 100 years, the Vikings in 1013 successfully uh, invade England and Europe. Uh, go back another 100 years, the Kingdom of Germany, and that was the emergence of the Holy Roman Empire. Go back another hundred years, Charlemagne comes to power and he unites Western Europe. Go back another hundred years, you have the Muslims take the, the Visigoth kingdom. So you have the Crusades, the, the actual jihad begins in 711 AD on August 30th, 711. Go back another hundred years, you have the Tang Dynasty in China, the first great Chinese uh, empire emerge. Go back another 100 years, you have the Justinian dynasty begins in Europe, and then go back uh, to 410 was when the Roman Empire collapses on August 24th, 410. So it's the second decade of each century, and we are overdue for an X event. And by the way, we look at the astrology, and it was massive alignments each time in that second decade of that new century. And when they aligned up the most, when you had three or more alignments occurring, which we're going to have very soon, towards the end of this year, a major X event, an unexpected black swan geopolitical event that have massive historical ramifications for the forthcoming 100 years or, or the became the landmark dominating seminal event for that century occurred and uh, pay attention to the month of august it's, it seems to pounce up a lot august september I mean, what is it july august september well, a lot of know, those things kind of kick, right. kick off around there yeah i mean what i'm looking at here is i see august come up i also see a lot of october november yes yeah. so it's october, august october. august through november yeah and november and, and in the woo woo community here the veil between us and them thins globally October, November. That's correct. Yeah. Uh, as well as that three or four thirty in the morning on wherever time zone you're in as it travels around as the our earth travels around the sun. Some of the prediction, I mean, so this is why I'm not conservative on saying, well, you know, Elizabeth Warren's going to win. We'll go back to the old policies that is as it goes. It's all going to be cool, fine, relax, nothing to see here. Uh, no, I actually think we're going to enter the crisis. We're already in a crisis, but we're going to, it's going to go full blown. And, you know, when we talk about World War Three or some type of U.S. constitutional crisis or the U.S. dollar, where reserve currency collapses or disclosure of the extraterrestrial, extraterrestrial presence on Earth, uh, or derivative market meltdown, or sovereign debt implosion, or large-scale regional war in the Middle East, or large-scale regional war in Asia. Uh, all of these things are, are now on the table. They have to be discussed. We cannot extend and pretend and live in our fantasy bubble world that um, the old days are coming back. That's not going to happen. We're going, we're in the twilight zone. Mm -hmm. We're through the looking glass. And uh, we have to realize that we're, um, in a, we're in a period of massive, massive civilization, paradigm shift transition. The shift, yeah. The shift is coming. We described it 
in 2014 as a the earth itself is saying look you either start living with the earth or again and not off of the earth or things are going to happen and one of the things was the political change and getting us kind of almost kind of dividing whatever countries in two or having two different ideological viewpoints really becoming strong within people getting them prepared to in the event of a, an event they have no problem going to war against each other. Right. And we were given an ex- I always say we were given an example of what could happen by severe weather hitting Puerto Rico. Clean Puerto Rico out, there's no electricity. So you can't go to the bank, get your money out, you can't use your credit card, you can't use your debit card. Uh, how are you going to eat? How are you going to feed your family? So for a month, well, probably over a month and a half, people had to barter and negotiate and get to know their neighbors more and, and help each other out. That happened globally. If we had another electric fart like we did back in 1859 with a solar flare knocking out all the power, mm-hmm. how are we going to get along? If that right. doesn't get us working together, then more severe weather, then a political uprising or a war or something. And if that doesn't get our attention, then we're going to end up losing like the Pacific Coast or something, some horrific geological event. What do you think about stuff like that? Well, you know, I think they're just going to be par for the course. I think they're not going to be the big thing. I think none of those things are going to be what's coming. I think what's coming is even bigger than that. I, I don't, I mean, I think, I don't think the Pacific go the Pacific coast is going to go into the ocean, but you could have the big, the big earth, you know, the big, the big one come hit in California. That's certainly a possibility. You could have, um, you could have a number of uh, geological uh, seismic events, volcanic events occur. You could see a convergence of a number of these uh, geological events that create uh, an ecological crisis and massive crop failures. But I don't think that's that's it. That's just going to be symptomatic of the collective change, the change in the collective psyche of, of civilization. And it's all about moving us out of a type zero civilization to a type one civilization. And that's going to require a massive paradigm shift in away from the current worldview and the current model of economics and uh, fractional reserve lending and central banking fiat currency system that we have or the type of uh, government that we have where, um, you know, so we're going to see major changes uh, at the social and institutional levels that would we would never think is possible. I believe a lot of these social institutions and financial institutions, especially the pension funds, are going to collapse. Most of them, uh, a lot of the um, systems where uh, that have been mismanaged by government, uh, a lot of the social systems are going to collapse too. So that's all symptomatic of the major shift that's going on to getting us where we need to go as a civilization, ultimately as a global civilization. Mm -hmm. And as a result, people are going through crises. They just, you know, they, they're, they're 50 years old and they're lost in terms of what to do next with their life or they're 40 years old and they realize they're still renting and will never, ever be able to buy a home or they're 20 years old and realizing or 22 and they realize what they graduated and are a hundred thousand dollars in debt for is they could never get a job that there's just no jobs out there for what their interest or what they're, what they're educated in. So they're all crises in different ways on top of these bigger crises all converging. And I think that's what 2020 is, is, is the, um, the, the collapse of the plausible cognitive dissonance that's even happening in the metaphysical community. There's a lot of people at Soul Summit, a lot of good people, but some of them said, William, I just, I'm just not going to buy that statement. You know, I, I think, I think um, the Democrats are going to win by a landslide and we're going to go back to the Obama policies and it's going to be kumbaya because uh, I'm meditating on it every day and maybe they're right, but, Oh. I don't think I don't think they're going to be. I think we all know we got to go through this. We have to go through the breakdown before we have the breakthrough. Um, it's always been a fight. It's never been easy. I I've got a lot of you know a lot of love for people who say you know I meditated on it, so it's gonna it's gonna be true. Well, you've got to really got to step back from your ego, people. <laughs> it's like it's not all about you. Globally, we could do something, but as an individual. Your your meditation about one subject most likely isn't going to change it, but if you can get a million other people to do it, yeah, you got a better chance at it. 
Um, right. what, do you, what do you think about the, when we talk about another hot war and looking back at what has been now documented on what had happened in, well, even in Vietnam, um, going from World War II with the Foo Fighters to Vietnam with full-on UFO interdiction with mm-hmm. aircraft and things uh, that were getting a little too close to China, which could have expanded the Vietnam War into a, a greater war with China. Having ET interference, keeping us from a nuclear confrontation and just keep it down to your basic regular weapons. Do you think? No, gonna, I think the U.S. is. In? I think the U.S. is is dealing with uh, one particular hostile alien group, and that could also be what the X event's about. I believe the U.S. could sufficiently defeat China in a war or Russia in a very short and intense conflict. I think the U.S. will continue to dominate between now and 2030 in that in that arena. I think based on these type of transits, we're looking. So look, it's either going to be China and Russia decide to to roll the dice. I and engage in a geopolitical power struggle with the U.S. that goes from cold to hot very quickly. Yeah. And that's already in progress. That's that's already happening to some degree. Whether it goes full hot and they decide to take Taiwan and the, the Russians decide to take back the Baltic states or go into Eastern Europe remains to be seen. I think if, if they take that risk, they have everything to lose. So that's the first thing. But I think the bigger thing has to do more with a hostile extraterrestrial group that the U.S. has been uh, developing weapon systems specifically for in an ongoing, low-grade, but ongoing conflict that's been going on since the late 40s. Is that the reptilians? I don't know which group they are called, um, I believe they're called the cryptoids or something like that. Uh, during the Reagan, yeah, the the CIA uh, briefed Reagan, and they went into the, that transcript. You can look up that transcript uh, of that briefing, and they talk about a particular hostile, known hostile, uh, unknown hostile, and known friendlies, unknown friendlies. I mean, so there's they put them in different categories, but there is uh, quite a bit of discussion about this and uh, that. They're a major, major problem for the U.S. military. Now, I had a brief conversation with um, Bob Lazar, who is um, reverse engineering or had claimed you worked at S4. Right. In, uh, re- reverse engineering stuff. Right. And that yeah. they've actually, they're flying the stuff that they've captured. There was nine, right. nine spaceships. Uh, his, one of the ones he was work, specifically working on was found in an archaeological dig and could be as old as 10,000 years. Uh, but, you know, they were working on the the fueling system, uh, the power system, and right, they the figured out system. how they worked. Right. But they actually flew them. And he and his buddies would go down to a lake. It wasn't Groom Lake. It was another lake. And they'd yeah. literally take a case of beer and watch these things fly around. Right. I don't, I don't live too far away from where they were watching those uh, vehicles fly. So um, I, I, I know quite a bit about that story. And, you know, I believe all of that is true based on not just his testimony, but others as well and, and certain revelations that's come out since. But I think it's way beyond that. I believe the United States has a super secret military space program that is generations ahead of what we see in the public sector. The public space program, NASA, is, you know, uh, not even remotely close to what they have. Mm-hmm. And uh, I believe Trump is going to be moving forward with disclosing this because of the plausible deniability cannot be contained much longer because it's quite likely that we're this crisis or this conflict can go full blown next year or in the early 2020s. It's quite possible. Now, this, I'm not saying this is definitive. How? Because there's a certain indeterminacy with astrology. We know there's going to be a crisis. We know the nature. We happen to know which horoscopes will be hit of charts, of nations, of leaders, of individuals, of corporations, etc. Of when the and we're going to see a reactivation of the Roswell chart. We have the moment when the Roswell crash occurred, etc. But we don't know exactly, unfortunately, and that's where the remote viewing comes in. And we do, we can do a remote views on what will be the dominant narrative for 2020, 2021. We could do a remote viewing on that. And that's what I'm working now on to get down to making more definitive statements. But I believe everything we've discussed thus far is on the table 
and in the realm of possibility. Uh, events that are highly improbable are now very possible as we get closer to 2020. Talking to William Stickevers, go to his website, williamstickevers.com. See the types of things he does. Check out some of the other interviews. Uh, we'll look at his, or I guess they're under events. They're, um, check his event calendar out. You'll see that his coast-to-coast uh, interviews, uh, the types of the Soul Summit in Scottsdale. And he's got a panel. He's been on, he's um, out in New York in 2020, January 3rd, 2024. New York Open Center Inspired Learning. And it's interesting. You've been there a couple of years, have you? Yes. Yeah, the New York Open Center, I'll be speaking in on January. Uh, I'll January 3rd, just, yeah. January 3rd, yeah, you got the event. <laughs> right. yeah. Okay, so I'll be speaking with a prediction panel. Uh, there will be an, a number of other astrologers, such as Gary Christian, Jenny Lynch, uh, Marza Miller, Steve Spear, uh, as well as myself, being moderated by Alan Steinfield. And he's yes. very much, uh, he's a... He's very much leading, one of the leading commentators and activists in the UFO community. Yeah. And he'll be leading that. And he's, um, you know, most of the predictions that the panel made uh, from last year has come to pass. And so the Open Center is now going to allow it to be streamed. Oh, interesting. Excellent. Right. So you can get that through new realities, new realities. Uh, if you look up Alan Steinfeld and New Realities, you'll be able to get access to that streaming of that event. Alan Steinfeld, New Realities, and yes. the streaming of the event in January 3rd. That's fascinating. And before I let you go, um, you know, we've, we've touched on a few things. I like the remote viewing. I, I, I love remote viewing to talk to you for hours on that. But uh, I want to jump into your UFO research and uh, – what you've done and kind of the things that you've bumped into and how maybe it has changed the way you look at not only the planet, but the universe. Yeah. I mean, basically the real issue with the UFO and ET disclosure has to do with the deep state. A lot of people can't get past that. The big problem for most people is not the fact that they might be here and that they're in our airspace and, and probably or maybe abducting people. The big issue is uh, there is an infrastructure, there's an intelligence, military intelligence infrastructure in place to keep this all secret and suppressed and to enforce secrecy. That goes back to the uh, Truman administration. So a lot of people just want to believe our government is, you know, this full disability and uh, they don't want to believe that there's another aspect of government that is actually bigger and hidden from what they what they grew up to believe based on the eighth grade civics class so part of the research I did with ET disclosure had to do with the workings the inception of the National Security Act National Security Administration in 51 which was secret until not known even to Congress until the late 60s and understanding the nature of the secrecy first and the clandestine nature of, of government and its policies of denial, lies, and deception as part of its, uh, as part of policy before I could get into really understanding about the UFO, uh, the UFO issue in itself and the threat it imposed on the U.S. military. I think that's what I see in a lot of the, the new media coming out where specifically with the Tic Tac incidents and the Nimitz battle group, you know, oh my God, is there something out there that has a, a better capability than us, therefore posing a danger, something that could fly through our battle group that quickly, go underwater, travel at that speed, pop out again. What is this thing and who's running it and is it a threat to us? Okay, that's a legit question, but they, they don't seem to be negatively interacting with us people at this time. Well, there's conflicting evidence. So a majority of what you just said is true, but there is enough evidence, which is what I put into my, uh, I believe it's a five hours. It's a five hour webinar on the astrology of ET disclosure in the Trump era. So this is, uh, Trump knows a lot more about what's going on and he's forcing the issue. He's forcing the deep state's hand. Who is the deep state? 
The deep state is a, an organization of, of powerful assets with deep within the military industrial complex, military industrial complex and intelligence community that works with private companies, private institutions that has its own shadow banking system, its own space program, its own military, uh, and is not operating under any constitutional uh, umbrella. It's not operating within a, a constitutional law and supersedes uh, any type of, uh, that's even supersedes Congress or the president. And that's only in the United States. Um, no, it is. Well, I'm talking about the deep state in the United States. That one I can easily prove out. But we know there's a deep state operative now in Britain. We see a deep state operating within the European Union. Uh, we, you know, the whole shadow banking system. So the question is, is how deep are they with other nations? And I think it's quite deep. And I think that they have an agenda that is not uh, necessarily American or principled in any way for uh, the continuation of the society as we've come to, you know, this is a continuation of uh, democracy, right? They want more centralization of control, command and control of resources. Uh, they, you know, they certainly want a one world government with the front of having nationalized trading states. So nation states would just be basically trading fronts so is it bad to have a one world government? Well, you know, I mean, I think if people, if, if that's what people want, I think they should vote for that. I think they need to know that's what they're going into. That's what they're working for. That's what they're educating their kids. That's, that's the world they are participating in. A lot of people that have no clue of this, right? And they are participating in sending their tax money to a government that doesn't represent them. And that takes and uses that money and puts it into a shadow banking system that is building a completely different civilization. That that it's not a civilization based on constitutional law, bill of rights, all those principles that founded this country at all. The global financial reset, the end of 2020, 2021 is part of what, you know, could be part of what this big X event's about. Mm. And when that happens, they're gonna go back to a gold standard and they're going to write off all the debt, but they're going to write off 60%, 60 to 80% of the debt. And when they write that off, they're going to repeg this new, the price of gold will go up to somewhere between 10 to 20,000 per ounce. And it will be marked and benchmarked or pegged against a new global currency, which will not be the U.S. dollar. And at which point you will move up to just outside of Sacramento, California, on a nice little place with a creek and get yourself a gold pan. <laughs> and start I need that gold. Yeah, stuff. it's coming. It's going to be tumultuous. Canada, the Canadian uh, domestic market is going to get very hard. Real estate's going to take a, maybe a worse hit. I think a worse hit than 2008, 2009. Well, I can tell you, it. Um, we could live with that here. I I bought a place for two hundred twenty two thousand just outside of Vancouver, British Columbia, in nineteen ninety eight, and a developer gave me two point three million for it last year. Wow! To build six townhouses and sell them for a million each on a lot, wow. a sixty six by one thirty lot. I mean, you know, we were saying earlier that you know people now are realizing they won't be able to afford to live buy a house. Right. My two my daughters are looking at me going, okay, so a condo is is eight hundred thousand dollars or uh, a, a townhouse is a million in our neighborhood or a million plus. Where am I going to work where I can afford to buy a place like that? Right. Absolutely. So we're going to see a lot of this bubble economy begin to collapse worldwide. We're already seeing it now. The, the, the place we're really going to see it is in Europe and in China. Yeah. They're going to get hit hardest. North America will get hit hard, but not as hard as the, those two other continents. Uh, Australia as well. Australia, the Australian economy is really strapped and their home prices are going to yeah. collapse. My country's it's commodities and minerals and lumber. We are also shipping you guys aluminum until Trump said we were a threat to your country. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. I didn't mean to threaten anybody by sending you old beer cans. Right. We've been talking to William uh, Stickevers. Please go to williamstickevers.com. He is everything, actually. Everything there is to do about uh, 
astrological work, uh, astrology, uh, charting, uh, just look up what he does uh, on the about section here on his website. Again, William Stickevers, that's S-T-I-C-K. E V E R S William Stick Evers dot com. Um, so you check him out at the events. Find uh, just Google him, and you'll find some other interviews. He's uh, mentioned a couple of times on the show tonight some of his webinars that he's he's put together. Um, he's one one I wrote down here E T disclosure, um, and, and during the Trump era. Uh, and a couple other ones are really interesting. The Rise of the Red Dragon and a Coming Global Crash and Financial Reset. So some of those things, uh, if you want to uh, scare the heck out of yourself for some late night viewing, uh, <laughs> check those things out. And yeah, and then buy some big locks for your door. And right. go to the bank and buy silver and gold and put it under your mattress. That's right. Or yes. crypto. Get or some crypto. Bitcoin. Crypto, yeah, Bitcoin. Crypto. Yeah, Bitcoin. Yes. Yes. What happens if... No, I was going to say, what happens if the internet crashes and we're out of Bitcoin? Or We're going to have bigger problems if the internet crashes. Yeah, that's what I used to tell people about, uh, well, if I register my gun, the government's going to come and take it from me. And I'm like, if the government was going door to door taking people's guns, you have way bigger problems in your country. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> and so, right. Something is led through the, a very small minority, a minority of the population being assigned to go to the majority of the population and take firearms away. Something's really screwed up in your country. Let's roll. And hey, 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 hey. Let's be careful out there. Far over the snow, under the voices. They sing and they go, under the voices. The good for the country. Hey! 